From Broadsheet, Australia's go-to culture guide, this is FYI, a podcast about the stories we reckon deserve a closer look. I'm Katja Vaktel. During the pandemic, we all became very familiar with takeaway and delivery. Australians are now spending three times as much on delivery apps as we were before COVID-19. And research says the pandemic boom is likely to stick around. But with stay-at-home restrictions hopefully behind us, many of us now have a dependence on delivery that we didn't have before. And some are pretty keen to shake their lockdown habit, including broadsheet writer Callum McDermott. Hi, Cal. Hi, Katja. Tell me about this delivery habit that you developed. For the last two years, ordering delivery has been one of the only genuinely interesting parts of my life. Oh, Cal. (laughs) I know, I know. Well, since the pandemic started, a lot of my old habits and routines just either completely changed or fell by the wayside, especially the way I eat. Yeah, I think a lot of people can relate to that feeling. Yeah, before COVID, I had a good balance. When I wasn't out at a restaurant, I'd just cook at home. Delivery was something I'd only do in extreme circumstances, like when it was raining. (laughs) Okay, so 2020 changed that. It did, and it got even worse in 2021. I was ordering food pretty much constantly, not really going to the shops, not cooking, and I was spending way too much money on it. You obviously decided to do something about it. You know, what happened? Yeah, so there was this sort of build-up. There were all these kind of different reasons that were swirling around, but ultimately I I just wasn't pulling the trigger because I was just too comfortable ordering delivery. But then something happened that made me determined to quit delivery for good. And that's how my six-month messy breakup with the apps started. Broadsheet's cookbook range includes more than 300 recipes from the country's top restaurants and cafes, so you can recreate the best of the best at home. And they're just $49.95 each. Find all four online now at shop.broadsheet.com.au. It's April 2021, and I've just ordered a burger from one of my favourite places. It's about a 30-minute walk, probably a bit too far, but only just... Ordering this specific burger has become a bit of a ritual for me. Do you remember that day in March 2020 where it all collectively hit us that the pandemic was here? Toilet paper was flying off the shelves and all of the news coming in from overseas was grim. And on that day, there was a tense, nervous energy at Broadsheet HQ. Broadsheet is fundamentally about getting out into a city and enjoying yourself. So what is Broadsheet? if you're not allowed to do either of those things. All I can say is this. Thank goodness for takeaway. When most places in the country were forced to close, my job basically became writing about takeaway, pop-up bakeries, best sandwiches, bottled cocktails. I have been thinking about takeaway every day for the last two years. And so I quickly became pretty addicted to takeaway. Specifically, using delivery apps, Uber Eats, Deliveroo, those guys. I went from using these apps once or twice a fortnight pre-pandemic to, I reckon at my peak, seven times a week. I wanted to quit the apps, but I just uh, couldn't do it. Which brings us back to April this year, when I'm ordering this burger for probably the hundredth time. But it's taking ages to arrive. It just hasn't gotten here. Not even close. Finally, the burger gets picked up and starts heading towards me. But then I get a message directly from the writer, which doesn't usually happen. And he says, Hey, sorry, mate. I've had an accident. I had no idea how to respond to that. Then a minute later, he messages me again and says, I hit a dog. And my first reaction to that was anger, because this meant my burger was going to get here even later than it already was. My second reaction was guilt and disappointment, that I'd become so lazy and entitled that my first thought was about my food, not the driver's well-being or the dog's. I don't even know what happened to it, because a few minutes later, my order was cancelled. 
That was it for me. That night was an omen, a sign from the universe that made me determined to give delivery up. The next morning, I deleted the apps and came up with a plan. Because when you're trying to quit something, you need a plan. Here's where I started. Step one, eat your mate's food. After a few days of not ordering delivery, my subconscious started plotting ways to use the apps without actually using them. My thinking was this, if you can't use delivery apps, just enable people who do. My housemate was the perfect target. He works in finance and regularly pulls big corporate hours. So he was always ordering delivery for dinner. So I started piggybacking off his orders. You're getting Mexican for dinner? Guess I'm having enchiladas. Ramen? Sure. Why don't we split some gyoza while we're at it? I'll transfer you. And for a while, we had the perfect arrangement. I got the smugness of telling everyone I was quitting the apps while using them nightly. And my housemate? Well, I'm actually not sure what he got out of it. The problem is, though, I made such passionate arguments against delivery that I unintentionally inspired him to quit the apps too. He deleted them and kept on living his life. Step one was a bust. I had to move to the next stage. Step two. Drive to collect my own food. You might think that this is an obvious and good idea, but at this point it's probably worth mentioning that I'm still on my L plates. Yeah, this step isn't going to work for me. Step three. Home cooking. It had been a month or so since the dog incident. And things were going pretty well, thanks to home cooking. I'm a good cook. It's not like I boil water in the microwave or anything. So I was getting by on weekdays. Weekends were a whole other story. I would delete the apps on a Monday, but by the time a boozy Friday or Saturday night came around, I'd be re-downloading them and giving them my card details all over again. It was that window in 2021 where Melbourne was in between lockdowns and open for business. And with all those activities came a lot of booze. My delivery kryptonite, it derailed my home cooking. I am ordering takeaway again. I think the last time I used one of the apps was exactly a week ago when I was in this same hungover position. Yeah, something needs to be done about that, but this time around I have ordered a burrito meal because I can't leave the house in this condition. I never used to believe people when they warned me that when you get older, hangovers actually last for the whole day. I've yet to experience the dreaded two-dayer, but I'm sure that's not too far off. Anyway, later on that same day, I was still in a horrendous state. So, it's still burrito day. I haven't left the house all day, um, and I decided to get some Indian off Uber Eats for dinner tonight. (sighs) Anyway, that's an interesting development. Delivery kept getting me in my tipsy, hungover moments of weakness, which takes us to step four. Backslide. Okay, so a backslide isn't really a step. It's more like a backwards one. But it's what happened. I was trying to quit, but I was still ordering delivery at least three times a week. So I decided it was time to call in the experts. I approached Dr Jason Pallant, a senior lecturer in marketing at Swinburne University, and he confirmed my suspicions. It's not just a matter of willpower. So there's so much mental effort that goes into any decision that we make. And so what we look for as consumers is shortcuts, ways to make that decision process easier for us, ways to reduce the mental load. One way we tend to do that is to go for things that we know, go for the things that are really obvious. What the delivery apps have done a good job of is being the place that you start. They're top of mind when you're thinking, I need to get something delivered. You don't think about, oh, maybe I'll look up every individual restaurant that's in my area and see what they're offering and see what their prices are. That takes a lot of effort. 
what the apps have done and positioned themselves as is we have all of the restaurants in your area we know what is available we know what you might like to eat come to us and we'll make that simple for you so i'm trying to figure out why i keep coming back to these apps again and again the answer to that is this idea of mental switching costs, right? So switching costs is the idea that, you know, once you're locked into something, it can cost you to switch it. So there's there's literal versions of that where say you're in a contract with a phone provider and you have to pay if you want to, you know, cancel that contract. But even in places where it doesn't cost you any money to switch a service, there is, again, a psychological switching cost to doing so. So if you are a regular user of a particular delivery app, they know all of your history. You've got all of your you know, payment details and delivery details saved in there. You've got all of your past orders that you can reorder really quickly. All of the recommendations that you're getting are really quite personalized. Then the prospect of switching to a different one or going back to ordering directly from restaurants, it does, again, take a lot of psychological effort. Okay, if we want to use these apps less or quit them altogether, we have to accept some level of inconvenience, right? Yeah, I think everything's a trade-off, right? And so if somebody is uh, offering you a really convenient, easy service, then you're trading off something. Are you trading off uh, quality? Are you trading off cost? Are you trading off, you know, what they pay their suppliers? And so if you want, you know, full control and to never be influenced by, you know, marketers or brands, there's going to be a lot of trade-offs that you're going to have to make. I think the message is not avoid delivery apps. The message is use them in a way that is going to be most beneficial to you. At Broadsheet, we work with some of the most talented photographers in Australia to showcase the best in food, fashion, travel, design and more. And now you can take that little piece of city culture home. Broadsheet Editions is a curated collection of our favourite photos from the last 10 years. Printed, framed and delivered to your door. Pick yours up at shop.broadsheet.com.au today. My free therapy session with Dr. Pallant gave me a lot to think about. And if I was actually serious about directly supporting restaurants, I had to be prepared to lose that convenience I was addicted to. No more laziness and no more loopholes. The wind was back in my sails. I was ready for step five. Find restaurants that do their own delivery. It had been a few months since I'd started this process. Life in Melbourne was feeling fairly close to normal. I had gotten my delivery habit down to about once or twice a week. Surprisingly, everyone I'd tell about my efforts would get really invested in seeing me succeed. People wanted to help out. One guy I met at a dinner party told me about a Korean restaurant in the CBD that did its own delivery. A lady I met at another thing told me about a pizza place that still uses its own drivers. So I made a note on my phone for places doing their own delivery. Eventually, I thought, I would have this entire lo-fi version of a delivery app ready to go, with somewhere on the list for every mood, price point and taste. A month later, I had two places on that list. The Korean restaurant and the pizza joint. And it wasn't for lack of trying. I called every restaurant in my suburb that I liked on the off chance they did their own delivery. No dice. The fact of the matter is, not that many restaurants do their own delivery anymore. I was convinced that my little note on my phone would be filled with options. But all I was left with was a very good Korean restaurant with erratic hours and long delivery times and an average pizza shop. Step five just wasn't working out. Then the Delta variant came along and sent Victoria and New South Wales back into lockdown. It was time to move on to step six. Ready to eat meals. So at this point, I'd figured out what I love about delivery. It wasn't so much about the quality. It's how insanely convenient getting the food is. If it was about convenience, why not just stock up on a bunch of ready-made meals? That way, whenever I was too lazy to cook, I'd have a bunch of things ready to choose from. 
I went to the supermarket and loaded up on a heap of ready-made meals, from established giants like McCain's to newer players like My Muscle Chef. It's not that they were bad. Pre-made meals have come a very long way recently. It just felt like I was getting the worst of both worlds. None of the pride and homemade feeling you get from your own cooking, but also none of the pleasure of supporting a restaurant you like. I needed another pre-made option, and the pandemic has given us a lot of options on that front. Before COVID, there were restaurants, and there were restaurants that also did takeaway. Like opposite cliques at high school, they didn't tend to mix with each other very often. But lockdowns changed everything. If you were a restaurant and you wanted to stay open, you had a pretty simple decision to make. Either you became a takeaway restaurant or you closed. In those early scary days of the pandemic, there was a hectic but inspiring creative energy coming from Australia's restaurants, bars and cafes. Distilleries stopped making gin and started making hand sanitizer. World famous restaurants like Attica started selling takeaway lasagna. Sydney Fine Diner Sixpenny became an outrageously popular bakery and Andrew McConnell's famous wine bar Marion became a grocer so successful that it got its own spin-off. So many of these chefs and restaurateurs would never have dreamed of putting food in a box before lockdowns. Now they were starting businesses dedicated to it. There are local pandemic startups like Kookaburra, which helps cooks with the logistics side of preparing and delivering ready-made meals. Makeout Meals, which is like HelloFresh, but you're cooking well-known meals from restaurants instead. And apps like Food Street, which lets you buy delivered meals from local home cooks and chefs. Like, you can literally buy someone's caramel slices baked to a family recipe. And then there's Providor. It's a company founded by Melbourne-based chef, restaurateur and TV personality Shane D'Elia, It delivers finish-at-home meals from some of Sydney and Melbourne's best restaurants. It's as close as I've found to takeaway tasting like the real thing at home. Using Providor was a definite step up from all that pre-made supermarket stuff, but it required some forward thinking. You have to order a little bit ahead and, as we've established, my delivery moments of weakness happened to me spontaneously. Even though I was only getting delivery every couple of weeks at this point, I was still in danger. So when I called Shane to talk about Providor, I asked for his advice. And what he said ended up leading me towards the end of my journey. I've quit all the apps, I've deleted them off my phone, and I'm sort of trying to get back to that pre-apps life. And, you know, I really want to support local restaurants directly. How can I do more of that? We can all sit there and say, okay, we want small business to succeed, we want these things to happen, but then our actions don't back that up. The only way you see change is by creating change. It's by actually doing the hard work and saying, no, I'm going to get off my butt and I'm going to go down to the local and I'm going to see Joe behind the counter. I'm going to say day because he needs that too, right? He wants that engagement. You don't get in the hospitality business to be locked away by yourself. You do it because you're an extrovert and you want to be around people. The restaurateur wants nothing more to see people in his dining room. It's, it's, it's not going to happen any other way. So you're saying put your money where your mouth is and make your life a little bit more inconvenient. Yeah, yeah, do it. You know, you might be inconvenient for a, a second, but look at all the, all the positivity that brings. That's just it. As much as I kept trying to find loopholes like piggybacking off my housemates' orders or trying to find places that did their own delivery, none of them were sticking. It's because they were Band-Aid solutions. They were never going to work in the long run. If you're actually serious about ordering less delivery but you still want to enjoy takeaway, there's only one real solution. It's simple and it's pretty obvious and it'll make you feel surprisingly good about spending half your weekly rent on food. It's the seventh and final step. Order takeaway directly from restaurants, then go and pick it up. A couple of months ago, I moved from Melbourne to Sydney, which had just gone back into lockdown. I'd moved into a new place and I had no plates, no knives, forks, pots or pans. Literally nothing. Suddenly, just like at the start of the pandemic, it felt like my life revolved around takeaway again. But then I realised that this was the perfect challenge. What better way is there to get to know a new suburb than by trying its bars, restaurants and cafes? Shane and Dr Pallant's advice was still ringing in my ears. I had been talking the talk. Now it was time to walk the walk. I had to get out there. So I'm literally just walking down the street just looking for options. 
I'm just walking around and if something grabs me, I'll go for it. Hello? Hello? You open? For you, yes. Ah, cool. Are you ordering? Yeah, I was just after a pizza. And you know what? It was the worst pizza I'd had in a very, very long time. There I was, totally chuffed with myself for finding a cool looking place, thinking this would be a great way to end the podcast. And then I tried it and it was just no good. But as I was eating alone and sitting on the floor, I realised that I didn't actually care how it tasted. I was just proud that I left the house to get it. What I'd really forgotten is that behind every takeaway meal, there's people. Let's face it, most hospital workers aren't in the game to just bash out meals whenever some computer tells them an order's been made. And as a customer, takeaway and that human connection you get when you pick up a fancy lasagna or a bunch of bottled cocktails gives you so much more than food. I'd also forgotten how good it feels to just take a punt on something. A couple of nights after that pizza, I found an amazing pasta place. The next day, a great sushi spot. When I need the convenience of the apps, I still use them. But I'm engaging with them on my terms again. If you also feel like you want to ease off delivery apps a bit, here's what I've learned. Ordering takeaway directly from a restaurant is never easier than using an app. But it's always more rewarding. And you'll never regret doing it. This episode of FYI was written and reported by Callum McDermott. The show is produced by Carla Arnold, executive produced by Ellen Fraser, and hosted by me, Katja Vuchtel. Martin Peralta mixed the episode and, along with Alexander Gow, composed our theme music. Additional engineering by Derek Myers at Castaway Studios. Design by the company you keep. Editorial direction by Ellen Fraser and Katja Vuchtel. Special thanks to Andrew McDermott and everyone at Broadsheet who helped make the show happen. To hear more FYI, subscribe in your favourite podcast player. You'll find us on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts and where all good podcasts are found. If you like the show, leave us a rating. If you want to get in touch, you can reach us at podcast at broadsheet.com.au. FYI is by Broadsheet, Australia's go-to culture guide. For more fascinating slices of culture in your city, head to broadsheet.com.au.